This episode is presented by Wild CBD. Wild produces the best tasting edibles on the market using real fruit and all natural flavoring. With flavors inspired by the Pacific Northwest, high quality ingredients, real fruit and consistent dosing, Wild has become one of the leading cannabis edible producers in the country. Wild's new CBD line currently offers real fruit infused gummies in blackberry, huckleberry, lemon and raspberry and CBD infused sparkling water in raspberry, lemon, blackberry and blood orange. Each gummy is dosed with 25 milligrams of CBD and can be purchased in a bottle of 10 or 20. Wild CBD is offering our listeners 30% off their next purchase from wildcbd.com. That's W-Y-L-D-C-B-D.com by using the code POD. That's code POD, P-O-D, for 30% off your next purchase. Wild CBD products are intended only for use by individuals aged 18 and older. Wild CBD products should only be consumed as directed on the label and should not be used if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. All wild CBD products are made with ingredients containing 0% THC. Consult with a health professional prior to using wild CBD in combination with any medications or other dietary supplements. Hello and welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Sangal. Hey. Hello. How's it going? It's going. We're both a little sick. Yeah. Maddie more than me. Well, that's just because I don't have a, an immune system. If you, had, if you had a crappy immune system, you'd be in the same level. Yeah. It'll get better. I got robots on my side. We'll be fine. <laughs> Happy November 1st. Woo. Daylight savings, which sucks. But it wasn't as bad this time. I think it was because I didn't go out drinking. There you go. You know, there's a pandemic outside. For those of you that didn't know. <laughs> for those that didn't know. Or maybe um, for those that are listening to this, you know, in the year 3000. In the year 3000. <laughs> so I'm going to go back in my corrections cubby. This week, we have to open the cubby. We're opening up the cubby. Uh oh. It's not do? really a correction, it's more of an apology. Uh oh. I apologize for the sound quality of the last couple episodes. Oh. Something weird is going on with my mic, and I'm doing the best that I can to fix the audio. But I know there are times when there's kind of like a weird, echoey thing after I stop talking. And sometimes oh. I do my best to cut it out, but there are times when it kind of seeps in in the episode and especially the last episode not the halloween special but the last episode kona was in my office while i was recording and you could hear her squeaking on something and i couldn't get all the squeaks audio out because oh, no fun fact i am not an audio engineer i'm just doing the best that i can don't have really equipment yeah, like i'm just doing the best that i can with adobe audition and my minimal knowledge on audio editing so if that was super annoying for people, I'm really sorry. And I applaud mm -hmm. you for sticking with it. And I wasn't super happy with the Halloween special. Like, I don't know. I've been feeling kind of bad about the audio quality recently. So I just wanted to apologize. Well, um, I don't know. I reject your apology because you're doing awesome. So Thanks. if anybody else out there has a problem, they can come to me at my house and I will give you whatever plague I have currently um, because you're rude and I don't want you to listen anyway. So. There you go. So that's that. All right. And I mean, obviously, October was our like paranormal heavy month. Mm hmm. So I didn't really want to jump right back into another paranormal story this week. Fair. Especially since those are kind of like palate cleansers. Like that's not really our bread and butter. Yeah. So this week we are covering a murder. Ooh. Okay. And this one's going to be bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready anymore. I've just been so used to like ghosts. Yay. <laughs> Plagues. Yay. Sure. <laughs> murder. Mm. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that what I signed up for? It is. It's exactly what I signed up for. It is. So this week we are covering the murder of Fanny Adams. Oh, she even has a cute name. Mm -hmm. 
So information for this episode was pulled from the following sources. A 2020 Owl Cation article by Ann Carney. A 2015 History Answers article by Peter Thorpe. A 2011 Anglophenia article by Fraser McAlpine. Nice name. I know. Fraser McAlpine? I know. It sounds what kind really of like name is that? Sounds like someone who lives in like the Swiss Alps. Or like, how do you get that kind of name? Like that's just so impressive. Sorry. It's okay. Sorry, Fraser. Dr. Alpine. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McAlpine. Dr. McAlpine. The Curtis Museum, the Hampshire Constab Constabulary. I can't say this word. Constabulary. Const it's like constable. Area. Constabulary? Yes. Constabulary History Society. I'm going to leave that in because I fucked that up real good. <laughs> you don't have to say that again, do you? I hope you not. You mention the constabulary? I hope not. <laughs> we'll see. I've already forgotten what I wrote. <laughs> so Perfect. I finished my notes this morning, so we'll see. Perfect. Murderpedia and Wikipedia. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes, as they always are. Awesome. Okay, so the phrase sweet Fanny Adams has a negative connotation. Oh. As something means nothing is worthless or basically fuck all. Is it kind of like bless your heart in the South? Oh, bless his heart. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But back in the late 1860s in the market town of Alton, Hampshire in England, it meant something much sadder and darker than its present day counterpart. I do have to put a trigger warning in this episode. Okay. It will contain graphic descriptions of violence against children. Oh, no. So if this is something that will be unsettling for you, I suggest you skip this episode, or I will be giving a trigger warning before I go through any graphic details, and I am going to do my best to keep those details to a minimum. So just know that up front. Okay. So Fanny Adams... Born April 30th, 1859, lived with her parents, George and Harriet, and her five siblings in a small cottage on Tan House Lane in Alton, Hampshire, in southern England. So it's believed that her paternal grandparents lived next door, which showed just kind of what a close-knit family they were. Okay. The daughter of an agricultural worker, Fanny appeared older than her eight years and was known for being cheerful and lively, not to mention mm -hmm. tall and intelligent. Okay. Her best friend, Minnie Warner, who was also eight, lived next door. And at that time, Alton was a large grower of hops. And until the mid 20th century, hops were an integral part of their economy, with many breweries opening in the town. And north of Tan House Lane is a place called Flood Meadow, which is surrounded by the River Way. Known to flood during times of heavy rain, a large hop garden was located next to Flood Meadow. Obviously, you kind of know why it got its name. Yep. And this will be important later on. Okay. And prior to this incident that would make hers a household name, Jane Austen was the most famous resident of Alton. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like really, really great and wonderful. And then like a grisly murder. Awesome. Yep. Cool, cool, and, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And crime in the town was virtually non-existent. Of course. That's always the case. Yeah. That's always like, how these stories a, start. It was such a quiet town. He was such a pillar of the community. So Saturday, August 24th, 1867, started like any other. It was hot, sunny, and peaceful. Fanny's father had plans to play cricket in the afternoon on the Butts, which was just south of the town. I'm assuming it's nice. some sort of special field for cricket. I know nothing about sure. cricket. And her mother was busy with household chores and minding her younger siblings. Okay. And I don't know where Fanny falls in the pecking order of her siblings. Okay. But when Fanny asked if she, her friend Minnie, and her younger sister Lizzie, who was seven, if they could go play, her mother Harriet had no reason to say no. Yeah, probably a nice hot day. It'd be good to get them out of the house. Well, it's less kids to have underfoot when you're trying to clean and stuff. Yep. So the girls headed out to Flood Meadow, where they and other local children had often played due to its close proximity to their homes, because it was just 400 yards away. And as the girls set out, they encountered a man named Frederick Baker, a 29-year-old solicitor's clerk who, two months prior, had moved to and started work for local solicitor William Clement in Alton. Okay. I wasn't able to find out anything about Baker prior to his appearance in Alton. Of course not. But the girls were familiar with him from church. Of course. Yep. And had no reason to distrust him as he was very friendly with the local children and a respected member of the community. <gasps> Pillar of the community, one might say. Yep. I'm not going to say it, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> I love how Willie belched as soon as I said that too. Like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that means. My sentiments exactly, Willie. Really. So on that day, the girls described him as wearing a frock coat, tall hat, 
and light colored trousers. And it was apparent to all of them that he had been drinking heavily. Great. Yep. Just what you want. Mm-hmm. Especially in polite society where you can't just tell them to fuck off. Yep. Because you're children. Yeah. You're eight. Yeah. And you, you know him from church and he's an adult. Yep. So apparently Baker was quite taken with Fanny and okay. offered her a half penny to go with him to the nearby hop garden. And he also offered Minnie and her sister Lizzie three half pence to go spend on sweets elsewhere before offering Fanny another half penny as further enticement. Ew. However, Fanny didn't want to go and stayed close to her sister and her best friend. And according to the girls, Baker watched them run around the hollow, which is a lane that leads to the nearby village of Shalden. Okay. Where they played and enjoyed blackberries that Baker picked for them. Mm. And after about an hour, Lizzie and Minnie were ready to head home. So Baker, seeing his opportunity, again asked Fanny if she would accompany him to Sheldon. When she again refused, he grabbed her and took her to a nearby hop garden. Yeah. Great. And it was roughly 1.30 in the afternoon at this time. Okay. So Minnie and Lizzie, both terrified, ran as fast as they could to tell Minnie's mother, Martha, what they'd seen. Well, wow, that's an alliteration. Mm-hmm. Minnie's mother, Martha. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Say that ten times fast. <laughs> so for whatever reason, Mrs. Warner shooed the girls away and told them to go back outside and play. No. So I don't know if she just thought that they were fibbing mm. or trying to play some sort of game. I don't know. Shit. But she felt bad about that later. So this oversight on the part of Mrs. Warner would cost them precious time, as it wasn't until Minnie shared the story with their neighbor, Mrs. Gardner, that the search for Fanny actually began around 5 p.m. Oh, my God. So roughly four and a half hours later. Three three and a half hours later? (laughs) Math? Four. Four and a half hours later. (laughs) Three and a half. (laughs) I'm just not even trying. Three and a half hours later. (laughs) Math is not my strong suit. Perfect. <laughs> I can't tell time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> Understandably concerned over what she'd heard, Mrs. Gardner fetched Fanny's mother, and the two set off immediately in search of the abducted child. And as they came upon Flood Meadows, the two encountered Mr. Baker heading back from the direction of the hollows, and they demanded to know where Fanny was and why he'd paid the children to leave. Baker explained that he often gave money to the local children. Mm -hmm. and had nothing to hide. And when Mrs. Gardner threatened to call the police, he laughed and told her to go ahead. Great. Taking him at his word as a respected member of the town, and with no further proof to link him to Fanny's disappearance other than the word of two small children, the two women went home without further questioning. Okay. And when Fanny hadn't made it back in time for supper, a group of locals formed a search party and started to scour the area around 7 p.m. They didn't find her at the hollows or in flood meadows where she'd last been seen. In fact, it wasn't until a local laborer by the name of Thomas Gates went to tend to his hop garden that evening that Fanny's final whereabouts were found. Okay, is this the trigger warning? This is the trigger warning. Okay. I'm going to be quick, but it's going to be really bad. So Gates found Fanny's severed head impaled on two sticks and tossed amongst the hop plants. Not only was she decapitated, but her face had also been mutilated with deep slashes from her mouth to her left ear all the way to her temple. And her right ear was cut off. Oh, my God. And her eyes had been gouged out. Oh, my God. Fanny had also been dismembered and disemboweled with her body parts and organs littered around the area with a leg and thigh found near her head. The entire contents of her chest and pelvis had been torn out of her dismembered torso and scattered, some of the organs also being mutilated. Wow. So really, really awful, heinous crime. An extremely brutal attack. How can anyone be that angry ever? Yeah. Because that would that would have taken not only a large amount of force, but that would have taken time. Who knows? Like if she was alive at any point, I hope to God she wasn't. Um, we go into that later. Oh, God. Okay. I missed the ghost. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, fuck. upon hearing the news, and I'm hoping that they just told her that her daughter was dead, not the gruesome details, Fanny's mother Harriet collapsed in shock, while her father, who was still playing cricket for some reason, was summoned. So I don't know if, like... Maybe there was a game? They must have had a game. Or because it was south of town, maybe people didn't think to go tell him yet because they weren't worried. 
Yeah. You know I mean? Like they weren't worried Seems enough. Like there wasn't a lot of crime there anyway. Yeah, they could have just been like, oh, maybe she's just out playing some more. Like, it's not anything worth canceling this game for. Okay. Obviously, I wasn't there. Obviously, I don't know. Right. <laughs> but that's what I'm going to assume, is that people just didn't think it warranted going and grabbing him before then. Okay. At the news, he rushed home and grabbed his loaded shotgun before heading out to locate Baker. Thankfully, his neighbors were able to restrain and keep watch over him throughout the night. And in an effort to help what would today be considered a forensic nightmare, several townspeople turned up the next day to search for and collect Fanny's remains. They transported them to a local house known as Ye, Ye Old Leathern Bottle, where they would be examined. Okay. And it wasn't until several days after her attack that all of her remains were recovered, including her eyes, which had been found in the nearby river. Jesus. This is going to be kind of bad, too, so I apologize. Members of the crowd were able to recover everything, including her clothes, with the exception of her hat, heart, and her vagina. Oh, my God. Her body was able to be sewn back together to the best of the surgeon's abilities for her burial. Mm. And she even still had the two half pennies clutched in her hand. You're kidding. So at the same time that Fanny's body was being collected, police led by Superintendent William Cheney and Police Constable George Watkins were out searching for Baker, who had gone to work at his solicitor's office in Alton High Street. Yeah, because why would he be worried? Yep. So while there, police arrested him around 9 p.m. that same day on suspicion of murder. And as they searched his person, police found that Baker was in possession of two small knives and that the cuffs of his shirt had small droplets of blood on it. And even though this wasn't much to hold a man on for murder, two more crucial pieces of evidence would later turn up. Fearing the lynch mob outside demanding his blood, the police smuggled him out the back door and held him in custody for a week before transferring him to Winchester, where another angry mob lay in wait. And once again, the police were able to thwart mob justice and secure Baker at Alton Damn. Police Station. Shit. I really like mob justice in that particular instance. Yeah. Um, instance. Yeah. So as far as that damning evidence goes, the first of which is an entry in his office diary on August 26th that read, killed a young girl. It was fine and hot. What? He just wrote that in there. Yep. And I'm sorry. I think I have the date wrong. I think it was supposed to be August 24th. Um, because he wrote it the same day. So that should have been August 24th. I'm sorry. Okay. The second was a statement obtained from a young child who saw Baker leaving the hop garden where Fanny's remains were found. The child stated that Baker was covered in blood and stopped to wash himself in a pond. And the police were able to corroborate this information because when they arrested Baker originally, the bottoms of his pants and his socks were a little wet. Mm. So their theory is he went into this pond to basically like scrub his clothes and then he just wore them back to work, which yeah. wouldn't be weird at all. No. Well, if it's if it's that late at night. Yeah. He's really looking. So Cheney researched Baker's movements the day in question and witnesses confirmed that he left work shortly after 1 p.m. before returning around 1.30. And if you'll remember, they encountered him around 1.30 Yep. On that street. He left again around 530. And it was around this time that he encountered Mrs. Adams and Mrs. Gardner near the hops field. A fellow clerk named Maurice Biddle told officers that he had seen Baker at the office later that evening around six and that Baker had told him about his meeting with Mrs. Adams and Gardner. According to Biddle, he seemed disturbed by the encounter and confided that, quote, it will be very awkward for me if the child is murdered, end quote. Interesting that you just had to say that. Yeah, because why would anybody assume that she would be murdered in a town where there's no violence? Yep. And later that evening, the pair went over to a local pub known as the Swan for a drink, where Baker told Biddle that he might leave town on Monday. When Biddle explained that he might have trouble finding work, Baker made the reply that he could, quote, go as a butcher, end quote. Oh, my God. What a psychopath. Jeez. Yeah. And we don't know how old Fanny was. She was eight. She was eight. Yes. Okay. Okay. So meanwhile, Dr. Lewis Leslie, the Alton Division's police surgeon, examined Fanny's remains and determined that she'd been bludgeoned to death with a rock prior to her decapitation and dismemberment. Okay. It doesn't make anything right, but it makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. To know that she wasn't alive when all that stuff was happening. Wasn't alive when all the other horrendous stuff happened. I was worried about her eyes. Yeah. I was really worried about her eyes. Yeah. Yeah, the eyes are always a hard thing for me, too. Yeah. I don't like eye stuff. No. 
So the Tuesday following Fanny's murder, an inquest was held at the Duke's Head Inn where evidence was presented and Fanny's remains were viewed by Deputy County Coroner Robert Harfield. When asked if he had anything to say for himself, Baker continued to say that he was innocent. Unbelievable. (laughs) Baker was transferred to Winchester Prison on October 19th. And during his time at the jail, he was said to continue to express his innocence while also enjoying jovial conversations with the chaplain and his jailers. Of course, because he didn't do anything wrong. Yep. Wow. At his trial on December 5th, Fanny's best friend, Minnie, was asked to testify. Really? And she's eight. (sighs) And even though she correctly identified Baker as the man who had abducted her friend, the defense strongly contested her identification of him and questioned how he could have used two small knives to dismember Fanny to the extent that her body was found. His brute strength, the fact that she's a child, adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) well, and the prosecution, I can't remember who the actual person was that presented this evidence because I forgot to write it down. Mm -hmm. But he had said that given her size and his size in comparison to her, he could have very easily committed the entire crime within a half hour to an hour. Wow. Wow. That's no time at all. No. And all throughout the proceedings, Baker maintained his innocence and presented a cool front. Of course. His defense pled insanity, claiming that members of his family also suffered from violent outbursts and that he couldn't be held responsible for his actions because he was abused by his father as a young child. Oh, you poor thing. Baker's attorneys claimed that his father was abusive to the point that he wanted to kill his own children and brought forth evidence that one of his cousins had been sent to asylums four times, that a brain fever had claimed the life of his sister, and that Baker himself had attempted suicide after a love affair. Yeah, I still have no sympathy at all. Yeah. But nice try. So the insanity defense was rejected by the jury. Great. And despite him continuing to plead his innocence of the crime, Baker was found guilty after only 15 minutes of deliberation by the jury. Perfect. Frederick Baker was hanged at 8 a.m. on Christmas Eve at Winchester Jail to the grim delight of some 5,000 angry villagers, many of whom were women, and earned the macabre honor of being the last person to be publicly hanged at Winchester Jail. Seems fitting. Yep. It came out after his execution that Baker had written a letter to Fanny's parents asking for their forgiveness of the crime he'd committed. No. Quote, in an unguarded hour and not with malice aforethought. He was deeply saddened by his actions, even though he had been, quote, enraged at her crying, but it was done without any pain or struggle, end quote. Well, of course. Sure. And he emphatically denied that he'd attempted to or had violated Fanny sexually. We'll never know. Yep. Wishing to forever remember Fanny, the town of Alton raised funds for a headstone that still stands to this day in Alton Cemetery, where she was laid to rest. The inscription on her tombstone reads as follows. Sacred to the memory of Fanny Adams, aged eight years and four months, who was cruelly murdered on Saturday, August 24th, 1867. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, verse 28. So as I mentioned at the top, the story of Fanny Adams took a twisted turn later in history. Mm -hmm. In fact, just a couple years later. So in 1869, the British Navy introduced tinned mutton to their rations for sailors. Oh no. And considered a less than desirable cut of meat. Sailors often complained that it was so awful, they joked that it was the dismembered remains of Fanny Adams instead of actual meat. You're kidding. Nope. Wow. And in fact, the gallows humor soon spread to the point that tinned mutton began to be referred to as a tin of Fanny Adams. And to this day, British sailors are served their rations in what has since been nicknamed a Fanny. And this slang unfortunately didn't stop with the Navy. Of course not. As slang tends to do, yep. soon spread to the general populace with the term sweet Fanny Adams becoming synonymous with something that was worthless or nothing in the Victorian era. Wow. And in our more modern vernacular, the term refers more to when you expect something and get nothing, like a profound sense of disappointment. So even though her memory continues to live on well past her death, unfortunately, the true account of her horrifying death has been lost to time. Wow. You know... That story makes me wonder, like, just how often that that really happens. Mm-hmm. 
like those like nursery rhymes and stuff, like how many of those were just like terrible, awful things that have happened to real people that we just now joke about because joking is one of the only ways we cope with stuff like that. Well, I mean, like in Jack and the Beanstalk, the part about the grind your bones to make my bread. Bone bread was a thing in France during one of the wars. Like I actually plan to cover that later. That's so that's definitely a real thing that happened. Yeah, I it's just all so awful. And it kind of makes you wonder the people that were joking about the rations, like the, the soldiers, they must not have known the sailors. You mean? Yeah, they must not have known the extent because I think if they if anyone would have known the extent of how awful her death was, they wouldn't joke about a child getting mutilated to that degree. Yeah. Like even. Yeah. As like a coping mechanism for like we're at war and this sucks. And this tastes like dog shit. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I thought that was pretty awful because yeah. I mean, even though it made, you know, national news, like you said, I'm sure they didn't include the horrible details. They just said she was mutilated. No, especially during that time. Like they it would have been sensationalized, but it they wouldn't have. It wasn't like the, you know, coverage of like the Black Dahlia murder and stuff where like they did give you the the gruesome details and you saw photos and like all this other stuff like I that just didn't really happen yeah so I think there is a much greater chance of people just like not understanding the full scope and not caring yeah but yeah that's really messed up yeah that's messed up yeah wow great so (laughs) um so podcast should we do good things now (laughs) like I don't I don't even know I don't know if I can find a good thing. I think we need a podcast book. Mr. Bat is where it's at. Oh, he's all that. And that's a fact, you know it. He's the king of the podcasting thing. Hey, freaks and geeks. This is the Roost Bat Show. Thank you for listening. Boom. So this week's podcast plug is the show Rooster Bat, and it's a show that does kind of a weekly live feed every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Twitch. And it's run by our friend David and his co-host and wife, Jess. Nice. David is extremely supportive of his fellow independent podcasters, and he's um, a genuinely awesome human being. He's also a huge supporter of the LGBTQIA community. Awesome. And just a, an overall awesome person. Okay. So I highly recommend everyone give his show, which is kind of like a variety hour where they just kind of like discuss anything and everything. Well, that's fun. Yeah. And they occasionally have like special guests on and stuff. Okay. I was just going to ask like, what kind of stuff do they touch on? But it's a, it's a smorgasbord. Yeah. It's kind of like a little bit of everything. Cool. And I'll include a link to their website because they're listed on a, several different platforms. But then they have links to all of them there. So you can choose which one you want to listen on. But yeah, Rooster Bat. That's a good name, too. Mm -hmm. They've got a fun little uh, (laughs) mascot theme song. Couldn't think of what it's called. Yeah, they've got a fun theme song. Awesome. Have to check it out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going back to the listener questions. Okay. Oh, man. So we have a listener question from Eileen at Crime Lapse Podcast. Okay. And this is your standard Reddit question. Okay. Would you rather fight 10 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? Duck-sized horses. Because ducks are the worst. And like, it could be like kind of cute to fight a bunch of tiny horses. And like, maybe you could tame them and make them your friends. (laughs) But like a horse-sized duck, like that's the apocalypse and everybody's going to die. Like, no, you don't mess with ducks. No. Hey, ducks. Yeah, my, fr- <laughs> my first thought when I think of like a horse-sized duck is, oh my God, it's going to try and rape everything. It's so, like, yeah. With, with their giant corkscrew penises. Oh, I was like, and was like, no, 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 no. I don't want mm. like a person-sized corkscrew penis attacking no. anybody. That sounds nope. horrible. So. That sounds like a nightmare. 
So I, as well, would take the 10 duck-sized horses because a horse-sized duck sounds awful in like the literal senses worst. of the word. <laughs> the worst case scenario in any scenario. Yeah. Yeah, no. That was quick. We were both like, was, no. We're like, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Eileen. <laughs> She's probably like, well, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, that was swift and violent. <laughs> Our reactions. That took a turn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would you like to go first with your something good? Yes. My something good this week is Willie. I haven't been feeling super well. I took a COVID test and I ha- I don't have the results yet. I'm pretty positive. It's just a really awful, awful sinus infection. Um, like what I had going on? Yeah, because I get sinus infections every year, no matter what. But of course, they had to test for COVID first, which I understand. But I've been self-isolating just in case. I typically do anyway. I only see like two people in my life typically. So it's just been really nice to have Willie because he's been a cuddle bug and he's just been watching and making sure I'm okay. And I'm just reminded again of how awesome my dog is. So yeah. He's my he's my good thing today, this week, forever. What about you? Um, I'm going to get real for a second. My something good is I'm thankful for Thomas and Talkspace and my friends because I've been really struggling with depression lately, which is probably part of why I'm like, oh, my episodes suck. Everything I yeah. do sucks. Yeah. You know? I've just been really struggling and I think I've mentioned it on the podcast, but for people that don't know, I um, do suffer from bipolar disorder type two. And I also am actively being treated for depression and um, anxiety. So, which is not easy, especially right now. Yeah. And it's something where I, I set up reminders in my phone to reach out to my therapist because otherwise the day goes by so quickly that I kind of forget to check in with her. Mm-hmm. And I've been avoiding checking in with her for two weeks, which isn't good. Like I've been purposefully not writing to her. No, but at least you're recognizing that that's something that's happening. Yeah. That self-awareness is important. So, you know, yeah, I've just been really down and I'm thankful that I have um, people that I can talk to about it who aren't going to be like, oh, just suck it up and go outside. (laughs) Suck it up. Go outside. Expose yourself to COVID. (laughs) Hug somebody. Right. You know, like. Yeah. There are certain things that you can do to try to help. But yeah, just thankful for people that care about me enough to recognize the symptoms and call me on it. And be there for me. Well, I'm sorry that you're struggling, but I'm not alone. I know no. I'm not the only person that is. Dealing no, with- you're definitely not alone. But a lot of this, even though like I feel like depression and anxiety, especially now, is really intense for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, it does ebb and flow and it does get better. And that's how mine is. Mine's very, um, I've had a physician in the past describe it as wave-like Mm because I will go through phases of ups and downs. They're kind of like waves where for a while I'll be down for a long time and then I'll crest back up to being more positive and stabilized for a while and then I'll crash back down. And so it's one of those ebb and flow type of things that happens throughout the year. And this is the type of year when it generally starts to dip down anyway. Yep. It kind of dips down for everyone. And so it's hard to one, acknowledge it because everybody's going through it. And two, you don't want to talk about it because it's something that one, nobody really wants to tell or talk Mm -hmm. about. And two, like... For as much as we try to like normalize mental health issues, there's still a lot of stigma associated with it. Oh, absolutely. Especially since like people, how we were growing up, nobody ever talked about bipolar or bipolar depression or Or manic depression or just depression in general. Right. And like, we're the generation that like talks about everything and we still don't always talk about it. And if we do talk about it, we don't tell the whole story because we were told not to. So I'm happy you're here. Thanks. And I love you. And the episodes don't suck. They're freaking awesome. And you're really good at audio because I can't do it. So just <laughs> know this, everyone. If the audio relied on my expertise, you would only hear uh, Willie's heavy breathing and smooch like knocking shit over. Like that's all <laughs> here of our episodes and it would be trash. So you're welcome. Yeah. I think you did a great job. And I love you. I love you too. Medicine. Come here. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, shall we? Yeah, I think it's time. It's time for a nap. We're both sick. We need to go to sleep. <laughs> oh, we need to go to a nap. <laughs> so I am going to start off with our merch so t public mm -hmm. is having tons of sales this month november okay. is going to be super sales heavy oh i suppose with christmas yep so there will be a store-wide sale of 35 percent off starting today november 4th through the 6th so wednesday through friday and then the okay. following wednesday through friday of november 11th through the 13th so if you've been waiting to purchase some of our merch because you want it to go on sale if you wanted to try and like get a couple things and reduce shipping costs now is the time to do it they will also okay. be having more sales at the end of the month that we will make you aware of at that time it's kind of closer to like black friday ish yep, -ish yep. Stuff. and um we are going to be talking about doing some new merch designs so if that comes out we will let you know we have an idea in mind that we're really excited about mm -hmm. we just need to make sure that it's a go before we execute Yep. And if it is a go, it's going to be pretty sweet. Yeah. Everyone should get like all of the things in it yeah. if it's a go. And I don't want to. We won't count our chickens. We're not yeah. going to jinx ourselves. But just know that we have new merch ideas coming. There will be new merch coming as well. So keep an eye on our Tee Public. The link mm -hmm. is always in our link tree on our bio. So head on over. And we do also have merch on our store for some of our favorite fellow podcasters. So you yep. can kind of buy it all in one spot. So if you want to support us and some other great podcasts out there, you can get it all from the one from one shop. Pretty handy. And their stuff will also be on sale because they're also part of the T Public Network. So it'll awesome. be sales upon sales upon sales. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> Only it's Wednesday. <laughs> Only it's Wednesday. March, March, March. <laughs> At the dome. So you can find us online on our mm -hmm. website at yeoldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on social at Twitter at yeoldcrimepod and on Instagram at yeoldcrimepodcast. You can also email us if you're so inclined. If you have story ideas, if you want to just um, share a listener story with us. If you have a question you'd like to ask, have us answer on the podcast and get a little shout out in response. Or just like send us gifts. <laughs> And us gifts, not gifts, but gifts, you know, things <laughs> yeah. that like move yeah, and make us smile. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Kent that did it once and made our days. That was so awesome. It was pretty great. He had it like was. a Power Ranger one that was pretty amazing. It was. It was pretty good. Yeah. If you like our show, even with the weird audio issues. That don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay they probably exist but it's fine okay get over it i mean it's covid your we, airpods we record via zoom we have not been able to record in person since before we even started this podcast so yeah, i don't think we've ever recorded in person we should make a big deal when we do i think we should do it for number 25 and this is number 23 when's number <sighs> are you are you are you inviting me over for thanksgiving is that what this is <laughs> This is a roundabout way to say I can come out for Thanksgiving. I think it comes out before. It comes out before Thanksgiving. But oh. I don't know. We'll talk to Thomas about Thanksgiving. I don't know what we're doing. I think we're going to try and avoid in-person things. But I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah. Five-star rating and review. Say nice yeah. things. You can just give awesome. us five stars and say something totally random. Like... I like snacks. I like Plague Doctors. Tell us about your favorite true crime story. It doesn't even have to be before the 1900s. You can share whatever you like. Yeah. Just say, I really Absolutely. like stories like this, or I really like things like that. And mm -hmm. we'll be super happy that you gave us a five-star rating and review. Yeah. Because we love you. We do. You can also support us outside of doing merch on our Patreon or our Buy Me a Coffee. Mm-hmm. For Patreon, you can support us monthly for as low as $5. And for Buy Me a Coffee, you can do a one-time donation for as little as $3. So it might not seem like much, but every little bit helps. I mean, we are yeah. an independent podcast. Yes, we have started doing one ad per episode to try and um, offset the cost of, you know, posting our episodes and paying for our website and things like that. So yep. Every little bit helps and every little bit is extremely appreciated. Absolutely. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime.